Sir, General Balashoff, ambassador for His Imperial Majesty. Since Peter the Great, no enemy has invaded your land, General Balashoff. Yet you allow me to conquer an entire province without even putting up a fight. Are you not ashamed, General? I can assure you, sir, that the Russians will fight like lions. The Emperor, my master, insists you withdraw mm. your troops. My brother Alexander is a novice in military affairs. Why did he decide to take on the Supreme Command alone? He might surprise you. He will be obliged to ask me for peace before two months have passed. We will stay here for a few days to replenish our stores of food, set up hospitals to care for the sick and wounded, and restructure the Lithuanian administration, Berthier, by using the resources of the local elites. We will form a provisional government and proclaim its autonomy. But nobody will fall for it, sir. The government will be under our control. Kolankur, I didn't ask for your opinion. Do you intend to declare yourself in favour of Lithuanian independence? To state loud and clear that Poland exists? There is no question of throwing our alliance with Austria into jeopardy. The Poles will have to wait. In those conditions, your calls for their patriotism will go unheeded. Part of Poland still belongs to Austria, and Napoleon needs his Austrian allies to ensure his victory over the Russians. The Russians did not spontaneously leave when the French arrived. It was a strategy that had been decided upon by the Russian High Command around one year before the French entered Russia. The retreat of the Russian army naturally had to be accompanied by every possible means to slow down the advance of Napoleon's troops. These means included the so-called scorched earth policy that involved destroying all available stocks of food, animal fodder and livestock. Continuing their pursuit of the evasive Russian army, the Grand Armée leaves Vilnius and the troops are forced to walk 12 to 25 miles a day, always heading further east. The torrential rain means that every step is a fight with the mud. <laughs> the Russians have burnt mills and depots, so there's no food for the cavalry. They take rotten straw from the thatched roofs, but the horses die eating it. With no bread and suffering from dysentery and wounds that go unhealed, soon there are thousands of thieves and deserters. Things started to go wrong from the very first weeks of the campaign. I wouldn't use the word famine, because that's a little excessive, but the first problems of food supplies were emerging. There were without doubt several tens of thousands of men who were thieving and living off the army without being operational in military terms. To bring his troops together and foster some kind of cohesion, Napoleon needs the major battle he's been longing for now more than ever. In the distance, they can see a host of tiny lights. They're coming from the Russian army's encampment. It's the Tsar's army. This is the moment they've all been waiting for. Here they are, close by, in his sights. Napoleon's goal is so close now. Tomorrow we'll see the great battle. Just one victory, another Austerlitz, and this war will be over. Sergeant Bourgogne and his men are preparing for the confrontation. They clean their weapons and check their rifles. They cut up sheets in case they're injured. On the battlefield, one must treat one's own wounds. Some are writing their wills, recording their last wishes, but dreaming of seeing their wives and children once more. Others seem carefree, singing or sleeping. On this campaign, Napoleon's losses in terms of men, horses and equipment are the equivalent of two great battles. He needs a victory, and soon. Sir, you must come, quickly. I'll be right there, Conancourt. Gentlemen.
Napoleon understands that he has been tricked. There will be no battle. The Russians have disappeared without a trace. The army continues on its unremitting way towards Smolensk. The Russian summer is hot, and drinking water is running out. Some battalions only have beer with which to quench their thirst, but they keep going. Despite all the difficulties during the early days of the campaign, Napoleon has a strategy. He is here to fight. And this strategy almost works because his various troop movements are forcing the Russian army to assemble around the town of Smolensk. The first artillery is fired at 6 a.m. Napoleon expects to confront the Tsar's armies, but only 20,000 enemy soldiers are present. They've received the order to defend Smolensk, whatever it takes. But behind the ramparts, this wooden town is burning. Men, women and children who were unable to flee are dying, burned alive or asphyxiated by smoke inhalation. The city is lost. Napoleon is victorious. He has captured Smolensk. But by blocking him, the defenders of Smolensk have allowed the main part of the Russian army to escape towards Moscow. Some will compare the tragedy of Smolensk with that of Pompeii. It's like the eruption of Vesuvius. A fine spectacle, is it not, Master Horseman? It's horrible, sir. Ha! Just you remember this. A dead enemy's body always smells good. Roman proverb. Sir, will you permit me to withdraw? It's the Russians who are stoking the flames while their army runs away, Colancourt. Now it will be the honor of your friend, Alexander, to face me at least once. <laughs> after which we'll be able to make peace, like two champions reconciling after a duel. War is simply politics, Colancourt. And peace will never happen while we're on this side of the Rhine. Colancourt suffers constantly from the pain I inflict upon his friend. The Tsar is not my friend. I'm more French than many others who only seek to please and flatter you. Please, calm down. You're addressing the Emperor. Why should I be silent? I am honored to have done everything to prevent this war. Sir, give me a mission to Spain. Let me leave this. You are too sensitive, Colancourt. You know the esteem I have for you. Alexander simply declares himself against England, and it'll be all over. And meanwhile? If he doesn't wish to see me crowned emperor in the Kremlin, he'd better seek to stop me. Hmm? Napoleon believed in a battle because he wanted one and he would win it. He remained convinced that Alexander would soon be asking for peace. And I realized that all I could do was to count on the good ideas that had until that point made me so happy.